Hello, good evening, everyone, and welcome to the Royal Photographic Society's historical group and the latest in the series of online collection talks and, and visits to collections around the United Kingdom. Um, it's a real pleasure this evening to introduce uh, Valeria Carrillo, who's the Photographs Collection at the Royal Institute of British Architects, REBA. Um, and she seems to, I think, well, I think she has probably the dream jo job in terms of the, the importance of looking, our, looking after one of the most important collections of architectural and historical photographs in the world. So that really is a dream a dream job and we're going to hear a bit about the collections and also Valeria will talk a little bit about the forthcoming exhibition that's open. Hello good evening everyone and welcome to the Royal Photographic Society's historical group and the latest in the series of online collection talks and, and visits to collections around the United Kingdom. Um, it's a real pleasure this evening to introduce uh, Valeria Carrillo, who's the Photographs Collection at the Royal Institute of British Architects, REBA. Um, and she seems to, I think, well, I think she has probably the dream jo job in terms of the, the importance of looking, our, looking after one of the most important collections of architectural and historical photographs in the world. So that really is a dream. A dream job and we're going to hear a bit about the collections and also Valeria will talk a little bit about the forthcoming exhibition that's opening next week that looks at uh, architecture and photojournalism from the late 1960s and includes work from people like Tony Ray Jones. So Valeria I'm going to turn my camera off now and I'm going to hand over to you. Thank you. Thank you. No, it's just checking. I am not muted. I am not um, and uh, I hope everybody can hear me clearly. Thank you, Michael, and thank you especially to all of you for being here rather than um, enjoying um, the beautiful evening and the beautiful weather that we're having. So um, I, I feel really, you know, I'm, I'm delighted that that you are, uh, yeah, that you tuned in for this for this talk. Um, I don't know how many of you are familiar with the RIBA um, or, and its collections. Um, as Michael was saying, you know, it's a, it's a privilege in a way to work here because the library and the collections there uh, are among the most important and the richest in, um, in the world. And certainly um, the Footers collection is, is one of the, um, of the largest um, of its kind um, worldwide. Um, so what I'm going to do, um, I'm just going to say a few words in general about the collection. Um, and then um, I will basically show you a lot of images. Uh, I've got quite a long presentation. Um, Trying to give you a sense of what the what what is in the collection, um, but I'm going to do that through a uh, basic an introduction to the history of architectural photography, um, a, a topic that pro probably you you know many of you are, are familiar with. But I thought it's it's always a good way to basically to introduce the collection rather than just talking about groups of of you know specific archives, and obviously that's going to come into the conversation as well. So as I was saying, the collection is um, is extremely large. I think um, I haven't we haven't done a proper kind of a, haven't had a proper assessment of how many items it includes, but definitely in some, some somewhere between one point five million and two millions, uh, probably one point six one point seven items and um, million items. And um, obviously we have a photographic prints, negatives, transparencies, so all sorts of photographic uh, media um, and uh, so many different processes. And, and the collection spans the history of photography, basically our oldest photograph is from the uh, 1840s and obviously we go all the way to the present day. It's also a very international collection because um, as you all know, photography, photographs travel very easily. So while our other collections are mainly British, the, the photographs collection is, is extremely international. Um, it also, in a way, uh, not only spans the history of photography, but also the history of, of architecture worldwide. Clearly, we have uh, we have gaps um, because um, the, the collection. It's very important to say that it's come together mainly through donations, donations from architects mainly, but also photographers. And we do acquire and purchase photographs um, occasionally, but that's you know it's it's a minimum part of what the collection is has been has been actually um, purchased rather than, than being donated. So what I'm going to do, um, what, I, what I would like to do, my aim with this presentation is to, um, I want to make a um, few particular points. One is to try and demonstrate and, and, and share with you the variety and richness of the, of the collections. The second is 
the fact that um, many people often think of architectural photography of just photographs of buildings or individual buildings or maybe streets at the most. But actually, I want to uh, hopefully demonstrate with this, with this presentation how often architectural photography intersects with other genre of photography, such as social documentary um, or photojournalism, even street photography and, and so on. So that's something I hope we'll come across um, from, from the talk. And the, the other thing I want to I want to show is um is the fact that in spite of um the, in spite of the fact that we have within the collections, we have some um examples of, of the work of some very, very well known photographers. But um I think what makes this collection unique is is a lot more like instead the work of many, many um extremely talented but um fairly unknown photographers in um the, People who are well known, maybe within you know um, the, the world of architecture, but not necessarily outside of um, of this of this area. So I hope that you will see, you know, because um, you will you will notice that some names are quite um, are, are quite well known, but others are, are probably not known to you. So I hope that to 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 make that point to my presentation. So all the photographs you will see are um, photographs in uh, that are in our collection. That's why. You won't see any credits. Occasionally, we, there will be some copyright um, uh, notes because obviously our images are, are are in our collection, but not the RBS copyright. Um, so um, I thought it was important to uh, to show that as well. So um, right. Um, starting at the beginning, so uh, the, the the RBA, interestingly enough, was founded in 1834. So you know, very close to the introduction of the first photographic processes, just a few years later. And the institute, in fact, started collecting photographs very, very early on in its history, um, together with um, a lot of other um, items, obviously books, uh, drawings, and 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 so on. So um, photographs came into the collection quite um, very early. Um, and uh, it's really interesting to see what, uh, how, you know, how architect in, architects engage with photography, because um, as you as you all know, um, architecture was one of the first topics um, uh, for, for photography, one of the first subjects, because clearly buildings don't move, so uh, they, they make very, very good subjects, especially when the, the exposures, you know, obviously were, were very long. Um, but apart from that, architects very soon realized how useful photography was for their purposes. Um, how it allowed them to uh, to to know or to 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 understand and to see ar architecture and building that might have been in very you know very very distant from when they are in different countries you know obviously not everybody could travel as easily as we as we can today so that knowledge you know uh, helping with the knowledge of architecture especially obviously in the nineteenth century where you know architecture was quite eclectic in terms of what type of, you know, style, borrowing from styles from the past. Um, it was incredibly useful and valuable um, photography for architects to document their own buildings, you know, their, um, what they were designing so that they could show it to um, to their clients, to prospective clients, they could share it with their colleagues, you know, so an incredibly important medium because clearly up until that point they had relied on drawings, but photography seemed to be um, a lot more accurate because obviously that was that sense that photography is a is a very faithful um, presentation of reality. Not only that, but um, the, obviously it was much quicker as as low as the photograph. You know, obviously um, uh, taking photographs was at at the time. It seemed a lot quicker than say you know um, than, than drawing. So there were plenty of advantages for architects too. And make the most of of, of of this new medium of, of photography. So here you can see one of our um, earliest photographs. It's a salt print and it was um, taken by uh, Maxime Ducamp while he was traveling with um, Gustave Flaubert in, uh, in North Africa and in the Middle East. Um, we have a few photographs taken by, by Ducamp at that time. Um, and it's, it's such an important example to show how often photographers traveled with um, with archaeological expeditions, with military expeditions, sometimes obviously, so they 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 joined you know this um, these expeditions and and took photographs and brought them back to the um, to the countries in the, in this case is is, is France. Um, I'm trying to move forward, but. You might just there we go. There we go. Done. Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm, it's 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 
it's a bit difficult. I don't know why. Um, so th this is another example of, of um, and we, we have a very extensive uh, extensive holdings of 19th century photography. I, I should have said that um, from the start. This is um, another French photographer, very famous photographer, obviously, Edouard Baldu. And uh, this is a, one of, a, of a, um, five, four or five photographs that we have of the new Louvre being built in the 1850s. So uh, again, an example of how architects documented um, well, in this case, it was it was it was not commissioned by a specific architect, but um, there was this sense of you know that new buildings could be documented accurately, not only once they were completed, but also during construction. So, um, this is a, 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 such an image that shows us that the new Louvre being built. Um, and uh, also um, a very important photography was very important tool to photograph um, urban development. So. Uh, again, this is a, one of a group of um, quite rare photographs of Central Park um, taken while the, the park had just been completed or was being laid in the 1860s, as you can see. Um, and they were given to the Institute actually by a visiting American architect. That's something that happened quite um, often at the time. So not only we acquired photographs through donations by British architects, but also visiting architects from other countries. They came and gave talks and lectures. And um, it, you know, sort of showed what um, was happening in their own countries, and then they would bring with them photographs that then they would donate to the institute. So that's you know that was also a very um, a very important way to acquire new, new photographs. Um, and also, um, uh, photography was very useful for, as I was saying before, for the in the, in the knowledge of uh, existing buildings, historical buildings, buildings that could be used as inspiration, or in some cases also um, it, it was a, a invaluable tool for restoration works. Uh, this is um, a fantastic carbon print from an album on the Chateau de Blois and um, all the photographs. Uh, it's a book in fact and it was it was printed but then there are all these um, there are some beautiful uh, color plates you know of, of drawings and then and there are all these absolutely stunning um, carbon prints uh, taken by Miss Mount of the of the castle which are obviously pasted in the album and you know like uh, incredible um, definition, and very, very beautiful condition as well, which makes them even even more even better. Um, and here's another uh, great photograph. This is um, one of the photographs taken by for the campaign um, the Sprawl the Society for the um, uh, for um, for uh, recording. Oh, well, I can't remember anyway at the moment. But anyway, it's uh, for photographing relics of old London. That's it. And um, so the, there are, we have again, maybe um, a 10 about the, of the photos that were taken at the time. And this was, the idea was to uh, record uh, this, you know, the city of London and to show how it was in a period of great urban transformation. So the idea of recording um, uh, things for the, for the, for the future. Um, so very important from that point of view, from the documentary point of view, but also you can see what a beautiful um, um, image this, this is. This is again a carbon print, and um, it also it's also quite um, interesting and representative because it shows us uh, that um, that uh, the, the tendency, the current in in British photography especially, to to create an atmosphere rather than, than you know like uh, uh, representing some um, a building in a quite um, objective, dispassionate way. There's this sense often in British photographers of, of um, the creation of, of atmospheres, something that goes beyond the, the, the pure document. And it's something that we uh, we see, for example, in especially in, in photographs of, um, I suppose, of ruins, uh, there's that sense of, you know, that connection with the tradition, the picturesque and, and, and kind of that romantic outlook. And, 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 a, and very importantly, that sense of um, a kind of kinship and of inspiration and, with, with you know if it came from painting um there was still obviously this very strong link between uh, photography and painting and drawing and the traditional uh, methods of visual representations uh, at the time in architecture that was also very true because um at the time the way buildings were photographed were mainly using the um the, the, the kind of imitating the traditional methods of visual representations uh, in drawings, in architectural drawings, which were um, mainly a straight on elevation, as you can see here, another photograph taken by Baldu of the New Louvre, or the two point perspective, also extremely common. So the idea was to show 
the building and you know as many details as possible you know the, the 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 image has to be very very clear in general there was this the, the, the intention of avoiding shadows because obviously shadows don't allow us to see see details so um often you know the these photos were taken as in this case in a kind of um a, a cloudy or you know like dim light you know like not um, not with strong sunlight where you know you have obviously the, the effect of light and shadow so there's there's this kind of code in a way of representing building of documenting buildings that follows the the same rules as um as architectural drawings and this is something that continues throughout the 19th century and up until the beginning of the 20th century you see this photograph of a, an apartment block in budapest um of the early 20th century and again that kind of sense of uh, straight on elevation and um, very, you know, uh, clear, um, you know, lots of details and um, and that is following those rules. But obviously, only a couple of decades later, um, so much changes. You know, like there is a proper revolution in, in in photography. We 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 have with the new photography, we have these completely different influences. The intention, as you know, for the first time, to create a a, a language that was specifically photographic. So. Um, there was that sense of distancing, um, uh, taking di you know a distance from from uh, the uh, from painting, from drawing, and so on, and finding a language that was specific of um, of photography, and that was a product a product basically of the um, of the medium itself, of the camera, of the of the technology of the camera, as well of of course uh, a product of that uh, primary tool in the creation of photographs that is light. So we obviously have the influence of um, of people like Molinaji, of Lodzhenko, um, and also in general of the both the new objectivity and the new vision filter down into the representation of architecture, which is really, really interesting. And we, we can to see how what this kind of influence, how it how it's you know it manifests itself. So on the one hand, you know, we also obviously at, at this time we have the straight photography in America. Uh, Charles Cheeler and also very influential. There are influences that come from different directions, as we know, in photography of the period and the new photography. And we see the results also in the photography of architecture. And that's also what I find really interesting here is that clearly, you know, with um, people like Molinaggi, Rochenko and so on, they were artists, so they obviously were quite free in the sense of what they were creating with photography. Well, most architectural photographers are work on commission. So it was a really interesting balance and kind of compromising and finding a way to um to um to, to, to inject that you know those those new ideas into into um, photography that had to follow certain rules anyway. So um we have for example in the field of new objectivity um you know following people like René Patch there's a very important German photographer. We unfortunately don't have any of his photographs, Vernon Mans, but he's the perfect example of this type of approach where the buildings are looked at in a very dispassionate, kind of neutral way, and um, in a in a kind of without um, um, trying not to or pretending not to um, to to look at them with a very personal um, from a very personal viewpoint and. Uh, in this type of photographs, definitions is extremely important. You know, the images are very sharp. They they have you know incredible clarity. And again, we don't have any photographs by Mans, but this is a good example by um by another German photographer following uh, the kind of the new objectivity current, which is out of um, Kirster. Um, on the other hand, um, we can also very very clearly see the influence of of the new vision, the idea of. Um, not necessarily at this point, you know, as we've seen before, the camera was always at a certain height. The idea was to keep the vertical straight, keep, um, obviously, um, you know, like for, to follow certain very specific rules that would give a very clear um, idea of, of the building photographed. And instead, here we start seeing a different approach. The idea of putting the camera, for example, very low, as we see in this photograph, and of using much more the diagonal and the contrast between areas of, you know, um, uh, of light and shadow. This is something that we're going to see over and over again. And what is particularly interesting is that um, the there was a it was incredibly fortuitous and really kind of um, uh, effective uh, synergy between the new architecture, and modern architecture, which was developing exactly at the same time in the 1920s and then 30s, and the new photography. And um, there was this sense that they were in a way made for each other and that the, you know, the ideas of new photography was you know, applied to architectural photography 
would, would basically uh, um, help for you know photographers to represent this, these buildings at their best. So this is, for example, in um, as some of you might recognize that one of the, the villas by the Corbusier. So I'm going to show you um, a few um, a few photographs from this period, mainly from the 30s, and and kind of point out of the the main characteristic of this cycle of photography, the photography from this period. So this is um, a fantastic image of the it's an actually very large print of a cinema in Marseille, and it's a really good example of how. Um, certain changes and advancements in technology at the time really revolutionized the way uh, that, that um, a building could be photographed. In this case, it's both uh, the, the advancement in the camera technology, uh, faster lenses, faster films, and so on, but at the same time, also an introduction of neon lighting and the combination of these two things made nighttime photography, um, effective nighttime photography, um, you know, possible for the first time, as this photograph demonstrates. Um, another important element of the um, photography uh, or architecture at that time is the fact that, as we know, once you know, once these um, you know, the, the 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 ideas of what photography is and what the language of photography is changes, there's also the sense that photography is not mainly used for um, representation or, or for recording, but also for interpreting um, things. In this case, architecture. Uh, and even creating, um, so not just recording and representing, but creating and interpreting. So, and conveying messages was um, a very important tool that suddenly photographers and architects had at their disposal. So the idea that photography, again, is not just showing something in a neutral way, but can convey ideas and even ideals, in this case, the ideals of modern architecture. So this photo, I think, is a very good example of how, what, what photography can do to demonstrate that um, the, the way of modern architecture that living, you know, modern buildings allow um, um, have a really healthy lifestyle. So they they it's it's a new era. It's a new way to it's a new way to live. You know, now um, plenty of sunshine, plenty of light coming from large um, windows. Clearly, um, you know, the idea of the roof roof garden or the roof terrace, like you can see here. That again, that sense of you know making the most of 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 sunlight, of the open air, and using that roof terrace uh, for you know healthy lifestyles. So we see this um, you know happy family and 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 a toy on the roof of this of this apartment block in again in Budapest. And all these these type of representation are so common throughout Europe and 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 America. You know, so they you can see very similar um uh kind of uh. Uh, themes recurring everywhere. So this could be in France, for example, but happens to be in, uh, in, in Hungary. And in fact, I think that the, the man in the in the bath is the actual as the architect of, of the building. But this sense of you know again of the happy family and you know and uh, the, the building based in sunlight and you know the, that sense of you know a new way of life and a much healthier way of life, which is a very important message that they were trying to convey about modern architecture. Um, this is one of my favorite photographs from that period as well. That's uh, it's in Italy, obviously in Milan, in the in the Triennale, taken in nineteen thirty-three, and it really it's really I think really representative of um, of how effective and powerful and um, that that type of photography could be. So here, that sense of using the diagonal and and with the vertical lines uh, for, to create a really really strong composition. The idea of using uh, the contrast between um, uh, light and shadow, light areas and shadow areas, um, and also the, the reflection. So the idea of, of reflection is also um, in, in the glass, because clearly the, the interesting thing, again, is that modern architecture, using very plain undecorated surfaces um, and reflective surfaces as well, really um, you know, work really, really well in, in, um, in synergy with the modern photography. So uh, it was it was the perfect people really for those for those ideas and um in terms of again projected shadows another really good example here I mean obviously we see a bit of the of the cityscape but it, it's a it's a it's a good example of how details become very important again with the new objectivity uh the detail acquires a, a, a new much you know a, a meaning and in architecture we see that over and over again so we see how often, the detail of the building is considered representative for the whole building and sometimes even more um, you know 
uh, the ideas they can tell us more about the building than maybe an overall shot, very traditional shot. Um, another um, really uh, powerful expressive photograph from this period is the famous um, penguin pool, obviously at London Zoo. Um, and here again, we see all that interplay of very strong geometric forms, in this case, curves as well, the reflections in the water, uh, the shadows of, of the trees. So um, a, a very effective composition, in, in my opinion. And interestingly, the photographer, John Havenden, was um, prim primarily an advertising photographer, but he took some of the um, really the most, um, uh, I think, the most effective, the most representative photographs of interwar British photography. Um, and then we certainly have a few very powerful ones, and uh, that's another one that he took at the uh, the Isotope building in, in in Hampstead. And again, that sense of um, utilizing the geometry and making the geometry really uh, important, the, the vertical lines, the diagonal lines, the contrast between the shadow areas and the, and the light areas, and um, incredibly effective, a very, very low camera angle again. Um, and uh, also, it's quite interesting the, the, the fact that he was an advertising photographer because, um, in a way, what these photographers were trying to do was to sell, in inverted brackets, the new architecture, um, the type of buildings that maybe people were suspicious of, a lot of people, especially in this country and certainly in America as well. So, the idea of, of um, making really, you know, the images of this, these buildings really seductive and, and attractive. And, and that was, a, you know, it was a very important tool for architects and for um, architectural magazines, especially because a lot of these images, uh, rather than being commissioned by architects, were commissioned by architectural magazines. And um, here's, a, I'm going to show you a few images of the, of the great duo of Ellen Wainwright. Um, I don't know if any of you have heard about them, probably some of you have. Uh, they were the official photographers of the Architectural Review throughout the 1930s, and uh, they really established, like you know, an identity, such a strong identity that um, you know they were incredibly well known at the time. And architects wanted their buildings to be photographed by um, by Baron Wainwright. And it was like almost that it become you know they it was jokingly said in the architectural press that it, you know that was the important thing you know that that um, that one could get their buildings photographed by then Wainwright, otherwise, you know, it wasn't it wasn't really there. Um, so this is, I think, a fantastic example of their of their approach or their of their style, I could say, um, incredibly sharp, incredibly well defined images. Obviously they were using filter and um, orange and red filters to uh, accentuate that effect, large format cameras, that's the other really interesting thing, because obviously, you know, a lot of the ideas that were filtering down from from the new vision, say, and you know, from those type of photography, they they were using thirty five mm cameras, Leicas, and so on. But the, um, the these photographers of architecture, they were all using very bulky cameras. Often their images are uh, the composition are very dynamic, but uh, the, the, it's all like a construct in a way. It's not um, a product of the use of um, of handheld cameras. Instead, most of all these photos are taken on a tripod. That's that's. Um, that's certain. But anyway, I, I think this photo is a really good example of, of the of how expressive and powerful their images are. And it's almost like um like my predecessor Robert Felwell said, it's almost like sometimes they leap out of the of the image, you know, the 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 the, the, the buildings. It's incredibly three-dimensional, I think. Um, and a couple of examples of their um trademark worms I've used and uh, birds I've used. This is um the um um the, the uh, apartment block, I can't uh, remember now, or in Brighton by Wells Coast. Um, and it's incredibly interesting how, you know, there's basically no not one vertical horizontal line. All the lines in the composition are diagonal. As you can see, there's this, this interplay of um, light and shadow and the, the kind of the lift shaft and the, all the, uh, the access balconies. Um, interesting also that it's a good example of how sometimes these images almost to go towards the abs abstraction. Uh, but in the case of Dan and Wainwright, I think was what well, I think it, it really shows their talent is that in spite of that, there's always this sense of the of, of um of the, the third dimension. It's like there's a depth. You can see that it's you know they're representing a space rather than just um a, a, you know a two-dimensional graphic um a device. And that's uh, that's another. It's like almost like the opposite that was taken from 
from this is from below, looking up, and this is the opposite. Uh, this is high point um, in high gate. And uh, again, that sense of you know the, the, the diagonal lines making the composition, the contrast between um, light areas and dark areas. And again, the balconies are playing a very important role here. And, and you can see here how this wouldn't be possible if, you know, if this, the surfaces weren't as plain uh, as they are. So it's it's uh, that's why a modern architecture really lends itself um, well um, to this type of, of images. This uh, the, they had enormous influence in Britain, and generally this type of photography, where the idea is to make the most of the building and almost to show it in, in a in a sort of kind of idealized way, continued also um, for a few decades after the war. Um, in fact, you know that's. That's that sense, especially with the worms I've used, I think that we, you get that what we now we would call the hero shot of the building, you know, it literally kind of looking up at it. So it's a very dramatic and very effective, and, and it's a way to state the importance of, of that project, of that design. So um, a few more images by then, and way right before we go to um, after the war, this was another common um, kind of device in, in the photo photography of that period, the idea of uh, comparing buildings to, uh, to to vehicles, the idea that they're both the product of technology. So here there's a there's an airport that already has a Ramsgate as the shape of, a, of an airplane, and it's, it's a very direct comparison with with an actual airplane uh, position in the foreground. So as I was saying, um, after the war, there's uh, that type. This type of photography continues um, thanks to uh, you know, some brilliant British photographers like John Morby. John Morby has started taking photographs actually in the 1930s. And here we can see one of his most famous uh, shots, I suppose, of the Festival of Britain. So again, the idea of using um, like this diagonal composition, low camera angle, tilted camera, especially, um, you know, it doesn't matter if the verticals are not vertical. And, you know, and, and again, it's like the perfect, the perfect match because this is about the futuristic uh, architecture, you know, especially the skyline. And uh, you know, a project, uh, the whole project was about looking at the future. So um, the perfect way to represent it probably um, at the time. This is um, John Morby again. Uh, you can see again that idea of the, the importance of geometry, the, the the looking up shot, you know, the ones I view, um, looking at this staircase. This could have been taken before the war, um, definitely. And uh, a good example of uh, what I was saying earlier about how sometimes these images almost um, 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 go into abstraction. This is um, the um, Metropolitan Cathedral um, of Plastic in, in Liverpool. And, you know, thanks to the use of, again, of the um, of the geometry of the building and the light, obviously, the position um, of the camera and therefore the use of the light, you can you get this, this composition that is almost abstract. Um, at the same time, though, in that period after the war, there were photographers who um, were um, instead highlighting, again, the idea of um, a new way of living. So how the new architecture, modern architecture could, um, could facilitate a, a new lifestyle. Um, and this is um, John Pantrin is a great representative of this type of photography. Um, his photographs, unlike um, those of, of many others, or oh, most most of the time have people in them, but the people are um, carefully posed. Obviously, not just people passing by. He wants to again um, his images convey that message of optimism of of the you know of the of the post war period and of this kind of uh, healthy happy lifestyle. So we see a child on a for example here reading. Often we see toys and in in, the, in these photographs and other props and carefully positioned the lights, the sunlight streaming in again large expanses of glass. So the message was was clearly there, and we can see even more in this other image where again with a very low camera angle we're looking up at the building and again another hero shot. The building is quite futuristic in itself. It's a it's a house on stilts and. Again, very strong contrast, rich stones, and the the children just to cap it all off, the children on the balcony pointing in, in the distance. So it's an incredibly effective photograph, I think. And clearly, we cannot avoid, and we can't avoid thinking of um, Judith Schulman, who um, um, very much, you know, that, that his photography is only, you know, obviously incredibly technically competent, but the, the, what, he's, what he's doing at the time is to. Um, to 
to really promote the, the, the lifestyle that could be achieved by you know living in this type of, of buildings and um, you know as, as Shulman said himself you know like um architecture is totally a way is a, is a way to sell literally said to sell to sell buildings and um, we also have photographed by his contemporary as for Stoller not probably as well known as, as Julius Schumer but equally talented uh, this is the Whitney Museum in New, in New York um however at the same time there's always been a, a current of um of photography of the built environment influences that by social uh, documentary, but more kind of um, a, a style that was you know less abstract and more rooted into 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 um, into reality in a way a way to look at buildings in a less idealized way. So this is with just jumping uh, back before the war just very briefly to because obviously we see um, this type of approach in the photography to the heart. We have quite a few of her. Photographs. She wasn't obviously an architectural photographer, but she photographed a lot of uh, of, of, of modern buildings in uh, in London, especially. Um, this is uh, Kensal Rise, um, and again, you, you can see a very different approach, and um, and people peeping out, you know, looking out of the, of the windows. And we also have some photographs um, by his brother Wolfgang Suchiski, clearly, um, again, streetscapes and and photographs of buildings, but. Um, a different type of photography all, all together. Um, one photographer uh, we as very well represented in our collection who um, definitely followed a different a different path, a different route is Eric de Murray. So he belonged to that group of people in post-war Britain who uh, were really trying in a way to rediscover the origins of modern architecture in Britain by looking at the early industrial age, you know, so buildings of the early industrial um, revolution, so um, 18th century and, and 19th century building as well. So buildings like this one, warehouses, um, mills, um, um, even canals, canal locks, you know, so all that kind of infrastructure, industrial infrastructure, not just buildings. And they um, they were working within what, you know, we're trying to rediscover what they call the functional solution. So the idea that these buildings that were built purely for functional purposes and they weren't even considered architecture actually they were architecture and they were the roots of modern architecture in, in Britain and in a way that was a definite parallel between functionalism of, of you know the modern movement and this functionalist tradition this functional tradition that they were they were keen to explore and to share with the public so um just to show you very very briefly some of these um, great photographs that we have in the collection uh, this is uh, Hastings, for example, this uh, fantastic fisherman's shed, um, the, nicknamed skyscrapers, and um, and again one of the um, industrial landscapes that he that he photographed amongst um, many many others, and um, a beautiful photograph of one of these um, um, warehouses. Um, similarly, there were um, other photographers. Often they weren't photographers; they were uh, architectural critics or architectural historians who were obviously looking at buildings and taking some, you know, very, very important, really uh, interesting photographs of buildings, but in, with a different approach. So George Everett, Kid Smith was um, an American architectural historian, but also an incredibly talented photographer. And he basically became a photographer in a way to illustrate his own books. So he traveled around the world, um, taking photographs mainly of modern architecture, architecture from the from that period, from the 50s and then from the 60s, and, but also comparing it it to uh, architecture, historical architecture. So he was always really interested in tradition to make that parallel between um, the modern language and the historical uh, language of architecture. So um, this is a house in Casablanca, for example, and you can see here some um, detail of housing and workers' housing in Naples. You can see that also his approach is quite playful, which I, I think is particularly interesting. And you can see it very well in this photograph of a uh, very unusual photograph of St. Peter's uh, Dome in Rome, taken from fields not far from, from the capital. Um, another interesting um, or interesting pair of photographers uh, uh, well represented in our collection is Ivor and Ivor the Wolf, who are in fact um, just um, nicknames, basically. They are um, they are not the real names of the photographers. The photographers were Hubert de Coyne Hastings and his wife. He was the editor and, um, and, and, and owner as well, part owner of the Architectural Review that, as you probably know, was, was and is one of the most important 
um, um, architectural magazines worldwide. So he was a very keen photographer, and uh, he and his wife, this is a photograph taken by his wife, and they, they used a pseudonym when they published, they were publishing their photographs. Um, and as you can see, they they weren't that really that interested in, 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 in grand architecture and monuments and so on, but more on ordinary buildings and on um, and on the, the cityscape, really. And um, you can see a good example here, another one, uh, how typical it is to see um, the, uh, the, you know, the, 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 the Campo de Miracoli in Pisa, you know, which is a, the perfect tourist destination, but photographed in a very different way that we could almost say it's, it's a bit like street photography a bit uh, later on. And uh, also they were extremely interested basically in what, in what they call the townscape. So what makes an urban environment urban. So all those elements, apart from the buildings, such as street furniture, um, signs and uh, paving, you know, changes of level paving, as you can see from this photograph. So again, like a, a, a different outlook and a different way to look at, at the built environment and to, to take photographs from that point of view. Um, one of the great photographers that we had in the collection from that period as well, the, you know, the first two decades after the war, is Edwin Smith. I don't know if any of you came to see our exhibition about 10 years ago, nine years ago here. Um, he was, um, again, not, maybe he wouldn't have defined himself an architectural photographer. He started um, before the, the war as well, but most of his career developed in the 50s and 60s. He was particularly interested, he studied architecture, so he had that background, but he was particularly interested in um, in historical architecture and historical heritage and, and the fact that at that time in Britain, things were changing so rapidly and there was this massive risk of losing a lot of the heritage which in fact happened. But he was particularly interested again in the in the ordinary, in the everyday. He did photographs of the cathedral and you know very important buildings, but he was particularly interested in that finding that um, a beauty, as as we say, in 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 the in the small things, in the everyday, in the ordinary. And this is um, um, the country house, Beverly Country House in Wales, for example. Um, one of his um, townscapes, views of Edinburgh. And here's a, a photograph again of the remains of a country house in Suffolk. Um, Liverpool Street Station. And um, Yeah, it's a beautiful shot of uh, Urbino, again, in central Italy, um, really cinematic. It makes me think about a film still from a, from a, a neorealist Italian film. And one of his uh, most famous uh, images of the Tulip Staircase in the house in, uh, in Greenwich. Um, again, at the same time, so many different things were happening. We, uh, there was a completely different um, uh, current as well that um, uh, you know, he started with Bernard Hiller Becker and um, a different way to look at building again in a very what we could call a very kind of um, supposedly neutral way um, of recording buildings again the industrial industrial um, structures in in this case and that's you know that's a very important tradition from the from the sixties as well that the a certain influence um, architectural photographers at the time and then we have a uh, um, Again, um, a brilliant photographer that is very well represented inside this photographic archive is John Donuts. Um, Donuts is particularly interesting, he wasn't just a talented photographer, but he, um, he, again, he's really started a different approach to architectural photography at the time. This is one of his early photographs when he was traveling, when just having completed his architectural studies. This is Crete. Um, but um, the, he was interested, again, in seeing spaces and buildings used, inhabited, he was interested in people using buildings, and so he was um, feeling that very strongly influenced by street photography and by photojournalism, as you, as you will see here. Um, this is uh, another one of his photographs of, um, I'm not sure where that was taken, but this is a, a, a brilliant photo of a new building, uh, the Boots Head Office in Beeston, and uh, he had a particular point to make here because he, he kind of criticizes the uh, mainstream architectural photography where you can always always see sunny sky and you know very strong contrast. 
Um, and he said he, he really showed you this photograph. You can take a brilliant photograph of architecture even when in, in grey weather and when it's when it's raining. And this is uh, again, uh, I think, a, a fantastic image. Um, other photographers obviously kind of straddle that 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 gap between you know architectural photography and social documentary or photojournalism and so on. This is big to me. Um, but you know, none better than uh, Tony Ray Jones, uh, who I'm sure you um, you will know, most of you know. We are really privileged in uh, that we hold um, the not obviously his entire photographic data, but he all the photographs that he took for the architectural review. So as I will I will explain in a minute, he um, he was commissioned to take photographs of housing um, in general and housing estates in in 1970. Um, and so all the photographs taken for this project, which um, again show that um, outlook of you know looking at buildings, looking at the built environment by showing people using um, these buildings. And we have um, we have all the photographs that we took for that project, which are um, incredible. And um, as uh, Michael was um, was saying at the beginning. Uh, you will uh, hopefully we will come and you will be able to see them in the exhibition that opens next week. And I will tell you a bit more about it, but I think I need to speed up because it's uh, I've already talked um, for a very long time. So this is just a, a few examples, of great examples of Tony Ray Jones's photographs, and you can see. I mean, to me, what what I find most impressive is the fact. I mean, this is a classic, I suppose. It's it's more about it's it's a portrait, we could say, rather than. And then the photo of, of, of the building. But yeah, there's this idea of how I think he had an, he discovered an incredible eye for, um, for um, representing, you know, for showing um, buildings and um, that uh, of composing, you know, and the, the composition that it creates. And at the same time, of, you know, something that is quite completely static architecture, but at the same time, um, his ability to capture. Um, the movement, you know, and uh, the the dynamism and the impulses and the uh, kind of spontaneity of people using these spaces, and uh, there's endless examples that I could uh, that I could name. Um, the project the, uh, that he worked for was called Man Plan, um, was commissioned by the Architectural Review. They also use other photographers to uh, work on other areas of um, of architecture and urban planning and design. So some regions work on housing. Peter Baster was also a part of it. Jan Baer, who you probably know from Magnum Agency. So some really brilliant photographers. Um, but going speedily towards the, the present day, um, this type of photography, again, influenced by, by this other genre of, um, of, of the medium, didn't really uh, take hold. Um, with the 80s, with the explosion of color photography, and the fact that more and more it was architects commissioned photography rather than architectural magazines, we see a kind of return to the idea that you know you, you see the building at its best in these images. Um, the use of colors, the use of again large format cameras, of um, strong contrast. Really, you know, as the color makes a huge difference compared to what um, photographers were doing a few decades earlier. But it's a, it's a, it's definitely it becomes a main, mainstream photography. It's the idea, of, the idea of um, again of showing the building at its best, almost to flatter um, photography, uh, um, buildings and architecture. Um, a couple of examples of, a, of one of the great, I think, photographers of the late uh, 20th century, beginning of the 21st century, is Richard Bryant. He uh, is particularly interested in that kind of, um, in the coexistence of historical and, and modern, like this is um, a photograph of the, one of the museum by Carlos Scarpa. In uh, in Veneto, and um, this is one a bit more recent of um, Skyline, one the Skyline from from Tate from the Tate extension. Um, we have um, mostly most of the kind of more recent and contemporary works uh, we have uh, are in digital format, but and we also started collecting um, prints because I think it's very very important to continue with the analog for a number of reasons that I'm not going to go into now. But just to show you a few examples in, um, of what we have of more recent material, uh, which also I hope demonstrates how many different approaches there are to, to the photography of architecture. And I always say they're all valid to me. It's not like um, one is more important than another. I think they're all valid. They always they all tell us something different um, about what we see in, about the built environment. Um, this is a Brazilian photographer who I, I 
Tupu Elijah acquired some of his prints a few years ago. Um, we, we could say influenced by photographers such as Basili Boy in all the topographics. And this is his hometown of Sao Paulo. And uh, finally, this is a, one of a group of photographs that we acquired from the photographer Alejandro Segarra. I don't know if you if you know him, but he won a, um, an, an award, a couple of awards, in fact, for this project, um, which is the Tower of David in Caracas, the uh, kind of never completed skyscrapers that was occupied by um, by families that, you know, homeless families, and they transformed in, in, in a kind of vertical city. And uh, and the photographs he took for this project, I think, are, are absolutely incredible. And obviously, he's a photojournalist, but in these photographs, again, there's such a great, um, you know, the way he captures the, the 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 building itself and the way that the inhabitants have made it their own and they've created their own domestic environment through it. I think it's something that uh, really struck me and, you know, the compositions are, are, are beautiful as well. So um, I thought it was really important to have this work and this particular project uh, represented in, in the collection. I'll show you another, another example of that. So I'm aware of the fact that we're really running out of time. So maybe I can go very, very quickly through the other images so that there's some time for questions. I just wanted to show you how, um, again, how varied is the collection by, by showing some examples of um, of uh, kind of landscape gardens and, and uh, this type of, of um, images, you know, going from the 19th century, early 20th century, and then um, into the 20th century, um, because this is um, you know what this is, and this is Kibbutz Smith as you seen before, fantastic image of um, an archaeological site in a site in Tunisia. Um, Edwin Smith, he was a he was a great uh, what, you know, he was called topographical photographer. This image all makes me very much think of a painting of Serra or something, uh, or or you know just uh, um, the painters of the post impressionism. And uh, again, with that touch of humor, really that sense of playfulness, as you can see here, um, but also some absolutely beautiful, I think, uh, landscape, pure landscapes. And I think he was particularly attracted by landscape photography, maybe even more than, than the photography of, of historical buildings. And here's another one of his um, wonderful um, uh, photographs of, of the countryside. Uh, this is in Lincolnshire. And uh, another photograph you've seen before, Eric de Mare, uh, again, a beautiful image, um, took on a stopboard. Um, we also have a vast number of photographic portraits by also by some important photographers, like Hitler and Tim Fry. This is John Braskin, for example. Uh, mostly, obviously, the, photo the portraits are of architects. This is Erna Goldfinger, photographed by, uh, by uh, Ila, who's the Camilla Felsler. The, the photographer, the Hungarian photographer who moved to Paris first um, and then to America. And um, I'm also very proud of this portrait of uh, Dennis Larson by Cartier Bresson. Um, then there's a classic idea of you know, showing uh, the architect next to his work, next to his, you know, uh, his creation. So we, there's this um, photograph of the architect Bruno Taut in, in Japan, who lived in Japan for a long time. So again, like a quite a, a kind of uh, a playful composition of him in front of this villa that he designed in collaboration with a, a Japanese architect. And again, interesting photograph of the, the Japanese architect, Don Kurohume, um, sitting on on, a, an, a, on chairs designed by him and, um, and by a table that he, he himself designed. Um, the, we also have lots of uh, portraits of artists. So this is obviously Ben Nicholson. With one of his paintings. This is a um, playful uh, kind of, it's not really a portrait, but I wanted to include it. It's um, Saul Steinberg, the, uh, the American artist, uh, when he was working at the Triennale in Milan in, in 1954. So that's his, obviously, his shadow uh, against uh, one of his uh, graffiti. Um, Henry Moore. And uh, this is also one that I discovered recently. I, I love this photograph. This is Aldous Huxley. Um, Taken, photographs taken by a non photographer, and then obviously photographs of photographers, um, self portraits, very likely. This is Oliver, uh, Mark Oliver Dell of Ben Wainwright uh, in, his, um, in his dark room, and um, I really like this one of John Morby with his camera again, quite a you know, like a heroic shot, you know, like a, he's, uh, he's a very important um, 
in the important person and uh, equally but much more you know i think ironic is this self-portrait by sam lambert with his camera um again with that sense of playfulness um and uh again a self playful self-portrait by nigel henderson here and finally other images you might not expect to find in our collection some stage sets like this wonderful art deco uh, one, um, also we have these sets of photographs of the set of Things to Come, the 1930s um, science fiction film, and also we have a photograph of adverts like this one from the 30s, um, advert for a, a radio cabinet, or even some fashion uh, photographs, this is like Edna Smith in the, in the 30s, and also uh, it's really interesting here to see how again sometimes these genres really blend into each other because um I can't help think when I look at this I can't help thinking about of oh, this one by then way right it could be a um a fashion image um and this is in one of the villas designed by Rubetkin and this one as well this is you know so pose it's an interior of a modern modern um house in Mayfair and um and this one particularly which I, again I discovered recently it's it's again, it's it's a story. There's a story here. There's a narrative. It's a it's a film. It's a film. It looks like a film still or something like that. Um, really, really interesting. Um, and finally, just a few very quickly, a few examples of that. We haven't really looked at the materiality of this collection. Clearly, you know, you all have to come and see and see look at them here the, at the RIDA. But obviously, we have um, a lot of albums. You know, like more than five hundred albums here. You know, it's really interesting sometimes. And like in this case, there are. And there's a card, um, you know, the, the owner of, of the album. So um, another example of uh, some of the albums are, um, you know, richly annotated by the by the owner, by the, the photographer. Um, and also I find it particularly interesting with the Architecture Press Archive, which is our single biggest um, archive within the collection. Um, it's It was a working archive. It's about photos that were published in architectural magazines. So you have all the history of that story and the narrative on the back of the photographs and um, stamps, photographer stamps, uh, instructions for printing, you know, you, you get all sorts of really useful information. Um, and again, talking about materiality, these are, again, within the architectural press, some great um, contact prints um, of images that they used in the in the architectural review and then by Laszlo Mohinaji. So uh, like it was a real find um, uh, within the collection that's also, um, and uh, finally, I want to let everyone know that um, we are going to have a photo festival in November. These are the dates and um, hopefully you will all come. Um, we have no details on, on the website yet, but hopefully they will go up soon. But uh, we're going to have lectures, um, workshops um, and um, activities for children. So a lot of interesting things. Um, you can find most of the images you've seen on uh, our online news database, Rubrix. And finally, um, this is the exhibition that um, Michael mentioned before, Wide Angle View, um, opens next week uh, at the RIDA. And uh, I hope to see you all there because it's about uh, that project that I was uh, saying before, Mount Plan, um, and how, you know, that idea how photojournalism and street photography uh, really created a completely different way to represent architecture at the time. Well, thank you, Valeria. That was um, I'm breathless now, and I think you, <laughs> thank you for sharing so so much from the collection. And uh, I don't know how you managed to choose. I'm not sure what a hundred or so images from 1.5 million. Um, that was a sterling job. Um, we've got time just for a couple of questions which have come in to me directly. And I suppose the first one is perhaps one of the more important ones. And the, the question is asking, who's the photograph collection named after? It's Robert Elwall. Who yeah. was Robert and, and why why is the collection yeah. named after him? Yeah, no, that's I'm glad that somebody asked because obviously there's so many things to say that you can't say it all. Um, so Robert was uh, not only my predecessor, but he was uh, the first curator of photography at the RIDA. Because why, as I was saying before, um, photographs had been collected by the Institute more, was more or less from the beginning. But until the beginning of the 1980s, there wasn't a dedicated photographs collection. Photographs were considered mainly as documents, so they were interspersed with 
with with the archives, with the drawings, you know, they, they were just mixed with everything else. Well, Robert is the one who got the Institute to recognize what an important and incredible resource they had, and that the photographs needed a different environmental condition from the rest of paper-based materials. So therefore, that it made sense to to separate them from the rest of the collections. And so not only he started the, the collection as such, but also he expanded it in, in you know, he did incredible, it, what he did for the collection is incredible because he he acquired, he um, acquired photographer's archives, he, um, really important photographer's archives, the acquisition of the Architectural Press Archive, which is an unbelievable resource was thanks to him. Um, and not only that, so not only he did so much for the collection, but also I think he wrote some of the most important texts on architecture and photography that, that there are. You know, he was a, he was incredibly knowledgeable. He was a, you know, I learned so much from him. He was a mentor and unfortunately he died prematurely in 2012 and um, the Institute decided to recognize the importance of what he had done for the photography and for the Institute. And that's that's why it was renamed. The collection was renamed in 2012. Um, okay, thank you for that. Um, you've slightly preempted the next question that's come in, asking: Are there any books on the history of architectural photography that you would recommend? Yeah, definitely. I mean, obviously, I would say first of all, the um, uh, Building with Light is the is is Robert's book on the on this topic. Um, beautiful title as well. Eric Demare came up with that. Um, beautiful book obviously I, I, but you know it's definitely I, I, I'm not sure what it's still in print but it's definitely possible to find it to find it online um but then there were there's there's a couple of others there's the um architecture transformed by Sergis Robinson Sergin Robinson and I can't remember the other author but if you if you you know whoever is interested you look up architecture transformed it's about that and also the book by Richard Pear which I think is about architectural photography from 1839 to 1939, so that kind of first century of, of photography in, uh, in architecture. As far as I know, these are the, the main books in English, in English language on, on photography or architecture, like wide ranging rather than more specific. There's a really, really good book by an Italian scholar called, called Giovanni Fanelli. If anybody speaks Italian or French, because it was published in French as well, he's, he's written a history of architectural photography. I think that's the title. And it's it's really interesting because it's rather than being chronological, it's a bit more thematical. So it's, it's structured in a different way and it's full of incredibly useful information. To me, it's been an amazing source. So again, I don't know whether it's ever going to be published in English, but if anyone speaks French and look, looks up Giovanni Fanelli, the history of architectural photography in French, <laughs> I'm probably going to find it. Okay, um, I think what will have to be our last question is uh, uh, the question is asking, um, what what do you collect today? Are you yeah, still adding uh, to the collection? Yeah, as I was saying, it's, it's a bit of one because we, um, our idea is always like we're trying to fill in gaps, so to speak, you know, because clearly we, we have an incredibly rich collection, but for any, it's like any collection that's uh, come together through donations, you have areas of of the history of architecture or certain specific architects or certain countries where you know you, you feel that you you know you don't have enough. So we always had that in mind. But at the same time, not having um having a very small acquisition budget, we often are reactive rather than proactive. Often we have to just see what's available and and what what we get offered in terms of donation. I, as I said, I tried to be a bit more proactive. I um, had tried in the last few years by asking contemporary photographers to donate at least one print <laughs> to the collection, and often it, it works. So we have, for example, one a beautiful photo by Len Binet, you know, and also some some other guy Tillim donated a, a photograph to the collection, which is which is great. So you know that that is obviously you know it's it's individual photographs, but it's it's one of the ways to do it. But it would be fantastic to to have a uh, obviously a larger a larger budget because when you when you when you don't uh, I mean and, and very few museums and collections have it let's let's face it so I I, I feel this as I was saying before so my focus is still very much on the analog because my colleagues who um, manage the image database where we also have a lot of um, contributing contemporary contributing photographers who uh, give us digital files so in a way he he acquires um, digital images and digital photography for uh, in a way it's a way to to acquire new images for the collection but. So I tend to focus more on the on the analog and and um, yeah and to especially when when you see things that might um, might either you know 
be disappearing one way or another, either being be disposed of or maybe acquired by um, private collectors, which, you know, I, I don't have any sympathy <laughs> private collectors or every, every right you want to, but um, it's just I sometimes I feel, you know, it's it's so great when, you, when we can acquire um, images that then everybody can, can see, you know, mm -hmm. because that's what, that's what I want to make that very clear in the round of the time that um, the the library, all the collections are open to anyone, not just to our IBA members or architects, anyone can book an appointment to come and see photographs like any other material in our collections and library, and that's we're very proud of that. So we we'll try to share them digitally online, but um, again, you know, I think most of the people on this um, right. call that's probably are interested in, in, the, in the physical objects as well, and, and that's that's something that for us is very, very important. So we want to, to make sure that people realize yeah. that they can come and have a look at the us. Right. Well, thank you. That's um, a perfect way to end. So thank you. Um, so I'd encourage anyone to go to to Reba uh, next week to see the the, the uh, wide angle view exhibition, which opens on the 13th of September. And I think Valeria has just given us uh, all an open invitation to come and visit the archives and actually look in person at some of those thank wonderful you. photographs and some of the other million or so that she she's holding there. So thank you so much for sharing the, the Reba collection with us, Valeria. And thank you for looking after what's one of our most important collections of photographs in the UK. So thank you. Um, thank you. We We've got further talks in the this uh, series, which Gilly Reed uh, uh, will be hosting, and we'll send out links for those, and there will be a recording of this available. Apologies for anyone that struggled a little bit with the sound. Um, hopefully, if you look at the listen to the recording, um, perhaps with a set of headphones, you'll you'll probably just catch a little bit more. Um, but apologies for that, and uh, in, enjoy the rest of your evening, everyone. And thank you again, Valeria, for for sharing your time and expertise with us. Good night, everyone.